I don't have a whole lot in the way of announcements to make. I did put a – I have got an interesting link to give you, if I can find it, for a radio program on uh, – that took place in San Francisco. It was called What Happened to Nonviolent Resistance? And it's a very good discussion with Jack Duval from the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict and uh, a woman who is now the director of the Ruckus Society. And we're going to be talking about both of those organizations in a bit. So if I run across that link, I'll put it on the board. And oh, yeah, here we go. Thanks. It's yourcallradio.org in the archive. When I send these things to you in course link, it doesn't seem to work very well. You don't get the link, you know, so I'll write it out here. 011507. Yeah, it looks like it's the last word is ROM. I didn't, I didn't plan it that way. Maybe I wrote it wrong, but <laughs> this probably, even if it isn't wrong, it'll get you there, I'm sure. So, <laughs> so that's a very good interview. I think uh, Jack Duval does a terrific job uh, coming at the culture of nonviolent resistance now from a strictly strategic point of view, but coming out very much on the same page as we're coming out from the principal point of view. He has a very, very good definition of Nagler's Law, though he calls it by some other weird name. <laughs> and uh, it'll be a good introduction to what both of those groups do. So before I start, you remember last on Tuesday we talked about – we did an overview of the theory. And today we're going to try to talk about training and organization as the state of the art in nonviolent movements today. I know a lot less about training and organization than I do about theory, but not knowing about something has never prevented me from lecturing about it, and I don't think I should start now. Um, and we're going to get into that very soon. But before we start, I wondered if you had any thoughts or any comments about our guest speaker on Tuesday, <coughs> Paul Chappell, from uh, courtesy of the United States Army. Yeah, Paolo? Uh -huh. who has been in the war uh -huh. and who is willing to go back to the war mm -hmm. as a side if the Americans want. So come and talk about nonviolence. Yep. How we can implement nonviolence. It was yeah. confusing and pleasant <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, confusing and pleasant at the same time. I think that's a good way of putting it, yeah. He's a very pleasant guy and he's very, very well-spoken and very sincere. What I got out of that was two things, which were both along the old line, Paolo, that on the one hand, it shows you how our system has become a trap for all of us on different levels. He enlists in the Army because he's, uh, he's very poor economically and because he's a recognizable ethnic minority. He didn't say this, of course, but because he's an ethnic minority, it's an entree into legitimacy in American society to join the military. But once you join it, it closes behind you and it, it's very, very difficult to get out of it. And the other thing that, I, that struck me is here he is appealing to us, the American people, to get out of the war and that requiring of us a certain amount of courage and sacrifice and risk how much stronger his position would be if he would step out and be a conscious, a conscientious objector and say, okay, I've done my part. Now I'm calling on you people to do your part. This, this is fundamental in nonviolence. In fact, it's fundamental in everything that if you call upon people to do something that you have not done yourself, the appeal is very weak. So it would be much stronger. I didn't suggest this to him, and I, may, I decided not to unless he's listening to this webcast. He's not going to hear me saying this. It's, it's his decision to make. But uh, he doesn't have to do exactly what we are being called upon to do, but he has to do the equivalent. In a way, it's harder for him 
Of course, because he's got that uh, whole institution. And they, the, the, uh, as I think I mentioned on Tuesday, desertions have been, uh, are up 300% uh, wow. multiplied by a factor of three. Well, come on, Seishi. In the last few years, and uh, as a result of that, the army has been cracking down on desertions. But it shows us, I think, how militarism and violence can become a trap on so many levels. Um, one of the most effective is this is, this is a term from uh, Kenneth Boulding. He called it the sacrifice trap. And I think I may have mentioned it before that once you have sacrificed for something, especially if you've sacrificed human life, it gets very difficult to say, oh, we made a mistake, it wasn't worth it. So having thrown away some lives, you then feel a pressure to throw away a lot more of them in order to demonstrate that the thing that you were doing was worth it. Yeah, we have talked about that, I guess. Okay, any other comments about, uh, yeah, Andrea? Yeah. 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 It's true. It's all strategic, and you should protest and stop this thing so it'll it'll save me from going back. I mean, one can hardly blame him for wanting that to happen. But you're right. He hadn't. There was no real engagement there with the principles. And if we were to ask ourselves compassionately, why not? The answer is very obvious. It would immediately throw him into cognitive dissonance at a very, very deep level. We had someone in the A course. Huh, they all do sort of run together after a while. I think this was two years ago. He was a chaplain in the US Navy. He had just come back from a tour of duty with the Marines. And I said to him over coffee, we were speaking Dutch, incidentally, just that he would feel to home. And he had a somewhat something of, it had been several years in Holland. And I said, I, I hope you're not experiencing cognitive dissonance. And he said, Professor Nagler, I'm experiencing cognitive chaos. <laughs> dissonance, it doesn't begin to say it. Because even to begin to come to grips with the idea that A, there is an alternative, and B, it represents human nature more immediately and more accurately than the war fighting part is to just throw yourself into confusion if you've made that kind of commitment. So that again, on the cognitive level, is how the trap works. It is nearly impossible for a human being to say, what I'm doing is wrong, but that's okay, I'm gonna keep on doing it. It's very difficult for a person to say that. So when you reach this cognitive dissonance, they usually say, what I was doing was okay for the following reasons. and I. I hope you won't feel this is cynical, but I wanted you to hear his reasons, knowing full well that I didn't believe them and you won't believe them, but it's interesting to hear where these people are coming from and what they have to do to make themselves feel reasonably comfortable with what they're doing. So we have been advised, we the peace movement have been advised by Kenneth Boulding for many, many years now. I mean, he's, he's passed on, but he used to say, we have overlooked our biggest opportunity in not finding a way to approach the military. I told you that story, didn't I, about my friend in an elevator in Washington? Yeah. yeah. I think probably one out of every four people in military service is desperately looking around for a way out of it. And that's huge. I mean, you need really 5% to make a big change in a situation, in a system like that. So if we've got 25% who are ready and willing to step out, if we show them something to step onto, remember Gandhi's Remember Toynbee's famous thing about Gandhi? He made it impossible for us to go on ruling India, but he made it possible for us to leave without rancor or humiliation. Now, if you look at anti-war protests during the Vietnam era, it was 100% rancor and humiliation. We were just so infuriated, and we took it out on the people who were trapped by the system at the lowest level. So we should learn that lesson and find a way that we can present them with a comfortable, secure, and I mean emotionally comfortable and secure stepping stone to step onto. Think of other ways that we can use their courage, their dedication, 
their discipline, and so forth. Amy? Mm-hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that um, calling nonviolence peaceful democratic change and to some people might it might help because it might help. some people don't know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Um, yeah. so I mean I think keeping the term nonviolence which sometimes maybe like it in that way might help. Mm -hmm. And also um his emphasis on appealing to conservatives. Yes. That was the part that I thought could really be most useful uh, to us because he's coming from that camp, so he can share with us how to talk to conservatives and people that we that don't agree with us. And I, I wish he had said a little bit more about that. As far as mm -hmm. Christian nonviolence, uh huh, will help for a certain type of conservative. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, just hang on one second. I'll read the. Uh, this comes up all the time. People encounter the word nonviolence. They recognize it's not a very good one, and they start they start offering substitutions. But in the end, uh, I've just come back to nonviolence in the hopes that we can explain what it means. At least we've gotten rid of the hyphen. That helps a lot. When it was non-violence, it was even worse. It was really clunky. And now at least we're sort of hinting that there's a thing there, uh, not a non-something. So. Until something better comes along, let's forge ahead with that. Unfortunately, Americans are not like Japanese. Now, why do I say that <laughs> in this context? They're not like Japanese in that we don't import a lot of foreign words very easily into our own vocabulary right now. We're also not like most Europeans with the exception of the French <laughs> in that regard. Um, so it's going to have to be an English word. We can't go around saying satyagraha. First of all, people can't pronounce it. <laughs> Second of all, we're only we're defeating our purpose because we're trying to show that this is something that's native to us. And here we are saying that it comes from some foreign language. Yeah. Arby, what did you want to? Uh, I was just kind of like expanding on that. You see, mm -hmm. first, uh, one thing that kind of like struck me when he was talking is like how not, he said nonviolence is a negation of violence. Uh -huh. like, we know that. Yes. It's, we're in a non biased class, but yeah. it kind of makes sense. Like, people who aren't in a non biased class who haven't heard of it will think that. Yeah, that's true. That's what we have to deal with. Just one second, Shannon. The, uh, a friend of mine pointed out, not without a certain amount of bitterness, that here he is writing a book on the peace movement, and he had absolutely no exposure to it. I mean, the reason that, that I met him and all these other people met him was he wanted to meet some people in the peace movement after writing a book on us. And now, this, he can't be blamed for that because this is what we've been saying all along. The word is just not out there. That's partly what we're about. Shannon? You have to be a little bit louder. We have this. He was doing what? Giving some follow answers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was hard for me to like I could sense a lot of passion Yeah. He was he was self laundering and I and I wanted you to hear that because this is a kind of person if we can't reach him and in a way we already have, but we need to, you know, enlarge his understanding. And in Meta we talk about inspiration, education, and support. So he's past the inspiration point, but we need to we would need to educate him. But we would need to be quite sensitive and respectful of the difficulties and the dangers of his position and not, you know, yank a stool out from under him. So who yeah, you had your hand. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I'm wondering if his use of words that politicians use all the time is something uh -huh. that that like the average American who's never heard of nonviolence uh -huh. sort of more resonates with. Like, I'm That's a good point. To us, it make sense, but maybe yeah. For other people, that makes a lot more sense. It might work much better for them. Yeah, much. So it's a strategic 
choice we've got to decide. And do we give them something they're familiar with and gradually lead them to expand it? Or do we give them the whole thing and try to help, help them cope with the shock of the unfamiliar and then bring them over? And I, I think it's just a judgment call depending on who we're talking to. Yeah. John. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't understand how hard it is to actually have all these people and then organize and actually get out of Iraq, you know, like mm -hmm. even if it's what the American people want, it's not necessarily gonna happen. You know. Well there, there is that, that there is the, you know, you can misuse. That's why I brought up my point, uh, which is actually a point that was made by Immanuel Kant in 1795, so it's been around for a while, that in a way, when democracies go to war, it's worse because you have this, um, this spongy, um, nondescript decider. You know, it's much better when you have some person Get, get up and say, I'm the decider. Uh, that person also has the responsibility. But when you say, it's the American people, and then you turn around, there's no way to find out what the American people are really saying. I'm an American person, by the way, and I was not in favor of this thing. I was not in favor of the massacre at My Lai, but Lieutenant Cowley said, I will carry out the will of the American people forever, which he later repudiated, incidentally. So, you know, it's a little bit like this ancient sacrificial practices where when they were going to kill a person, they didn't just uh, designate the priest who's going to stand up and do it. They somehow spread it out among the whole community. So therefore you really cannot. And then I noticed to my shock that when we carry out executions uh, in the former method used to be gas chamber, they used to have three people pulling three levers and you didn't know which one actually dropped the pellet into the vat. So you were doing exactly the same thing that these ancient ritualists had done and exactly the same thing that we hide behind when we say, oh, it's, it's the will of the people. But A, you haven't really canvassed all of them. B, there are some issues which are not questions of majority opinion. You know, as Martin Luther King said, I don't, in some cases, I don't care what the majority says. You know, even wasn't it the governor of Indiana? No, it was the governor of New York. For the majority of New Yorkers, by a slight margin, were in favor of the death penalty. And he said, I'm sorry, this is a moral issue, and it's not a question of numbers. There's not going to be any executions under my watch. So there's, there's those two things. And then thirdly, a big issue, which he didn't address and almost never gets addressed, is what if the American people have been lied to, just theoretically, <laughs> then, then, you know, really what is the value of that moral judgment of yours? Yeah, Shannon. People don't what? People don't want war, they want survival. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's where we, yeah. You know what that reminds me of, that people want, don't want war, they want survival. It's like St. Augustine said, nobody wants war, everybody wants peace, but they think that war is the way to get there. Uh, it's a lot like, the per per we're going to hear next week from someone who is a representative of nonviolent communication, and their whole approach is based on discriminating between needs and strategies. And this is not unlike things that we've come at through the nonviolent economics route and through other routes. On the level of real needs, there is no conflict among human beings, between human beings and the planet, between human beings and animal life. There's like, I have no problem with the squirrels that we just saw over in the FSM cafe. Um, but there's a distortion that comes in where we think that our method of achieving those needs is what we need. And it's on that level that we get into conflicts. So it's just a question of disentangling that for, for a person. You know, we have to do that in ourselves and then help the other person to see that. 
Well, uh, all I can say is it could have been a lot worse. I have had people who were from the military affairs programs here come in and talk about what they're doing. You remember some, and really they, uh, they did a much worse job of explaining what the purpose of militarism is than, than Paul did. So he's really, I was amazed actually, to tell you the truth, at the things that he felt that he could say. Because we've had people come into this class and we say, what about this? And they say, I'm not allowed to talk about that. Okay, there's one issue, hang on one second, Paolo, there's one issue we haven't discussed yet, and that is the legitimacy of putting yourself, I suppose we have touched on it, but it's worth rep repetition. As T.S. Eliot says, you will say that I am repeating myself. Very well, I will say it again. <laughs> uh, it is not okay to surrender your, I'm gonna use a term here, that I hope you'll not misunderstand. It is not okay to surrender your moral judgment to another person or group. There are certain things for which you as an individual have to retain responsibility. And life and death, killing or non-killing, is one of them. That was what the Nuremberg Principles were all about. Matthias? Oh, yeah. yeah. But you and then Paolo. Yeah, so by the same token, yeah, it, it felt like he, he didn't own up to the fact that he was so that he put yeah. responsibility on the people. Like, it's not my fault. Like, you know, yeah. Like, yeah, you have a choice. I remember one of the people, you have a choice. That's what we always have to bring home to them, but we have to be able to do it uh, gently and respectfully so that they can. But we had one person who came in here to uh, this class and said, well, if the war is legal and it's been declared by constitutional authority, then I'm supposed to carry it out. But it turns out that the president had not been elected. It had been electoral fraud, and the war was illegal, and he was still carrying it out. And that, that's the thing. They say we will only do it within this legal framework, but once they get into the system, they're just going to do it. They're trapped. Yeah, Paolo? One of the points I found really interesting, and I've been going to the information, is the privatization of the military. Oh, program. very good point. I've this is terrific. I've watched documentaries, I've been reading yeah. about it, but the fact that it says we don't count how many private uh, companies, how many of them were killed. Yeah. It's not democratic anymore. Yeah. What could you tell us about that? Well, not anything very pleasant. Uh, the person I'd recommend to read on this subject is Naomi Klein. She's a journalist from Canada who has uh, documented in great detail. She wrote a book called No Logo about globalization. And she has documented in great detail two things about the experiment in Iraq. And this is why. I've been convincing a lot of my colleagues in the peace movement that we have to stop that experiment. It has to fail because if it fails, we may have gotten the leverage to stop globalization. And if, if they succeed with that, globalization will be very, from a, for globalization from above, of course, will be very, very difficult to stop. So one of the things that she showed is that what they're doing in Iraq is like a perfect laboratory case of how you do neoliberalism how you eliminate the competition, downsize the government, and privatize everything. Uh, for in Iraq, human beings have been sharing water from the Tigris and the Euphrates for 7,000 years without much difficulty. But we move in there, we being Bechtel and certain other countries, say, oh, you're wasting this terrific opportunity. This isn't water, this is a source of profit. And they privatize it and start selling it to people uh, the whole catastrophe, as Zorba the Greek says. But the other point that she was making is that the army has been corporatized and privatized. The army is, looked, is described now uh, in corporate language as having a core competence. This is how CEOs speak. In CEO speak, you say they have a core competence, namely combat. Everything else should be supplied by profit-making private institutions. So everything from getting your hair cut to sending a letter home, in some cases getting armor, and now, now you're having these private militias, which if you remember our uh, lecture from John Lindsay Poland, this again is a way, it's a shell game. It's a way of hiding the responsibility, remember? The Colombian army 
is responsible to the government of that country, which is ultimately responsible to global opinion and American money, the two being almost synonymous in this case. So they can't carry out human rights abuses. So what do they do? They set up a private militia. They funnel all the money and the weapons to them, and they carry out the abuses, and the army looks clean. So similarly, this is why if you look back at Roman history, there were these praetorian guards which served as the bodyguards for the emperor. Now once they, you had a bodyguard, the temptation was to use them for purposes other than protecting yourself from bandits and terrorism, but to use them for everything for which you can use threat power. So these private militias, the, the Praesidium, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. The abuses got worse and worse. And on the road to democracy, one of the most important steps was not to have private mercenaristic, mercenary militias. They had to be under the control of the state decision-making apparatus, however flawed it was. So we have now gone backwards about uh, 1,800 years in setting up Blackwater and all of these private companies. Yes, Alex. I'm just going to add also, I had a chance to meet him last week, and in that conversation, he said that these, uh, the people working for companies like Blackwater, yeah. Yep. Yep. Not, not to mention if you read Kathy Kelly, who has spent a lot of time in Iraq, and you have a bit of a s thing from her writing in your, in your reader, which as usual we'll never get to, uh, <coughs> but I hope you read it and enjoy it. Um, she points out that the average Iraqi who is facing destitution can earn seven or eight thousand dollars at some enterprise within Iraq, or he can be paid, you know, sixty or seventy thousand dollars for working in some capacity with the army or one of these private corporations in security or some other capacity. In which capacity he is very likely to be assassinated by his fellow Iraqis. So it just sort of creates somehow injecting a huge amount of violence into that country has not made it better. So maybe that should be our last comment on uh, what Paul Chappelle shared with us. And on that situation, talk a little bit now about training and organization. Um, the way I see tr the training I is on three levels. And that will not surprise you because by now you know that for me, Reality comes in three levels, and I, I see everything in three levels. But for better or for worse, hope you all got this. I'm going to start with the deepest level, which is also the part that has to be the most individual, and that is getting yourself to have whenever you need it and not just when the occasion will call it forth, the capacity to convert negative drives to positive drives in yourself. And I was very pleased that in the section that you're reading from Kevin Danaher on the Seattle WT WTO protests, a in Global Uprising, page 249, for those of you who didn't bring your reader with you today. He says, one of the tricky skills to develop is to take the anger and the pain and transform it into positive energy. As, I, as I've said from the get-go, from the beginning, this is the fundamental nonviolent act. When you've done it, you can induce it in other people and you're on your way. Amy? That reminds me of the Martin Luther King. Yes. Before. We did not suppress our anger. Yes. We very good. Released it under discipline for maximum effect. So he, King, in that con incidentally, I hope you got the King quote that I sent out. Cross with. Um, he is saying more, a little bit more about the active, you know, carrying it out, releasing it under discipline. But Kevin Danaher here is talking about the actual conversion, which is like a millisecond before that happens, even 
And, you, and he goes on to say, in those dark moments of the soul, you have to say, do I really have the right to wallow in self-despair because maybe we won't succeed? Which is, you hear that a lot. You know, oh, the problem is hopeless. The last woe is, woe is me. Or do you have an obligation to little kids dying in Africa or somewhere else and have to say, come on, let's get back in the ring? Uh, we have to convert positive action, start acting no matter how hopeless the situation may look. You've had your few moments of wallowing. I can't quite finish the sentence because we're on the air. But he uses a word that I don't want to use in public. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's right here in your book, page 249. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so uh, unless you can bring this about, you're, the best that you're going to be able to do is carry out a behavior which you hope will signalize to people that you're not threatening them, and that, but on the other hand, you insist that they change. But when that is backed with this actual spiritual conversion, it has a much deeper impact. Um, now, so what are the techniques for training yourself to do this? Somebody else want to say it? <laughs> Save me from the embarrassment. <laughs> Meditation. Thank you. Eight o'clock in the morning or six p.m. in the evening. What you're actually doing is you're doing this on a small scale with every thought that comes up in your mind. And uh, Paolo. Uh, Zoe, <laughs> take care of this man <laughs> after class. <laughs> yeah. So more on, more on this later. Uh, we, we know this is, uh, this is seditious because every single year uh, international and area studies forgets to put this in the catalog. And I have to discover it at the last minute and put it back in. So that's our signal that this is a really useful thing to do. <laughs> But yeah, I won't say a whole lot more about it here because I, I can teach a whole course on it and it also is going to be webcast. <laughs> and because, as I say, it is, it's kind of an individual matter. But the important point to, to, I guess there's two important points to make about it. One is that this doesn't work very well if you do nothing particular, you do your same old, same old, and you hope that when you get into a tense situation that it will be there for you. That's, uh, that's dangerous folly. That is probably not going to work. This is something that you have to do when you're not in danger repeatedly so that it's there for you when you are in danger. There's a, a funny uh, saying in India that when, when you're going across one of these dangerous rope bridges that are swinging across this chasm and you have makaras, you know, crocodiles snapping away down below. They say, on the bridge, it's Rama Rama. Back on dry land, it's Kama Kama. <laughs> Rama being Rama and Kama being selfish desire. So that, that doesn't work very well. So you need a systematic way to respond all the time to negativity as it comes up in your own consciousness. Then when you're faced with a dire situation, the negativity will start coming up and you will transform it so that you can release it under discipline for maximum effect. My, my favorite kingism, and that's saying a lot. This <laughs> guy is very, very good, very eloquent. So, but the second point I wanted to make is the fact that we read about this in a statement by Kevin Danaher, who is the co-founder of Global Exchange. Global Exchange, or GX as we call it in the field, is a wonderful organization, it's a good example of a stable, financially viable uh, nonprofit that is not explicitly dedicated to nonviolence. That's why they're stable and viable financially, but which actually does nonviolence in various ways. They don't insist on it, teach it, demand it, but they do things that fit very much into our framework and they're very much open to it. And Kevin Danaher's wife 
is Medea Benjamin, whom I'm sure you've heard of. She's the co-founder of Code Pink, and she's, she's been arrested innumerable times, which is the first step on the road to being declared a saint. <laughs> so uh, there's this question of spiritual practice, and also it has to permeate your lifestyle. That's why the most uh, common definition of principled nonviolence when we're trying to contrast it with other types is that it is a way of life. That's not how I go about it, but the, it's a reasonable way of doing it. Because if you get it deep enough to where it pervades your whole life, then you're operating on it as a matter of principle. Okay? So note that we've started with a kind of training which is very difficult to document and which often people don't even associate with social change, but which the world in general is gradually coming to realize is uh, an essential element. Elizabeth. Uh huh. And they were Yeah. And but a lot of the stuff that we're talking about working in fact yeah. is very similar to them. So yeah. it's really, I think, more tangible way that principles on violence work in society. People recognize yes. that it's a lot about meditation and transformation. Yes. Of your negative energy and mm -hmm. positive energy is more That's a very good point. Isn't step ten in the 12-step program is meditation, I believe. and. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, you'll be happy to know that our meditation center has just written a booklet in conjunction with somebody who came through that program, just written a booklet on meditation for uh, AA people, AA or NA. This is a very good way of reaching out. Now, it is possible for, for a human being to harbor inconsistencies and contradictions. In fact, it's not possible for a human being not to harbor inconsistencies and contradictions. And so I think we should not say that anybody who goes through the 12-step program will be a nonviolent activist at the end of it. But it's definitely a method that people are recognizing that they need to capture negative energy and convert it into positive energy. And that's, we could use that. Great. So while this is the most important uh, level, and without it we won't really have anything to mobilize, I don't think there's a whole lot more we can say about it here. And I'll, I'll go to the next level, which is, I'm calling it right now, handling emotions. This is very similar. There really is an overlap, and I think it's in this level at this level in this area that the nonviolent communication comes into the picture. So we're going to hear that next week. And this is n not primarily about – no, let me start that again. This is not operating directly on the forces within your own psyche, but rather on their expression. And you'll hear this very eloquently from Mickey Kashtan next week. How can you interact with a person in such a way that you're responding to their needs in a way that helps them see their needs and your needs and go on from there? So this is a hugely successful program. I'll just – nonviolent communication. It's one of the deeper and certainly one of the most successful ways of doing that. There are programs of a similar type, like when we talked about uh, restorative justice. Remember that interesting topic? We said that there were groups going out into prisons. One of them was called VORP, Victim Offender Reconciliation Program. But another is AVP, AVP, which stands for the Alternative to Violence Project. So, and one of the main things that they do is they take offenders who have been incarcerated and they uh, get them to – they teach them how to express themselves in language because a lot of the violent behavior comes from the inability to get respect, make your needs felt, and express yourself in words. If you learn how to do that, you don't have to 
hit somebody upside the head with a knuckle duster or whatever it is that you're going to use, <laughs> which is a very crude way to get respect, maybe even counterproductive. Okay. So again, to pass on very quickly, but you know, each of these things is you know, useful to explore further if, if it's any help to you in your papers and so forth. But there is a technique which has been relied upon for a long time specifically within social change movements, and that's role playing. I would say that this is because it deals directly with behavior and only indirectly with attitude. This is maybe a step more superficial than uh, and nonviolent communication, which is in turn a big step more superficial than meditation, in my humble opinion. John? Uh huh. You talked about how sometimes you feel something that's because of something that you did. Like if you like you support something, or if you don't need to do something, then you think, oh, I must really feel for that cause. I think if you see yourself acting kindly, then it'll become more emotional. Yeah. I don't think we should r rule out the efficacy of behavior altogether. But because it is possible to act out of one set of motives and conceal another, even from yourself, in itself, action is not the place I'd like to start. That's why I like to start it with the inner conversion. Then the action is bound to have its effect. But it's also the case, and psychologists have proven this to the extent that you can prove anything in that field, that uh, <laughs> if you act as if, you felt kindness towards a person, it will resonate with the potentiality at least of feeling kindness towards them. It does have some effect, but it's just because the body is so much grosser than the mind, it's a very much cruder and in, in, indirect way of going about changing the mind. Who was the, uh, Arby, was it you? Just elaborate on that. Okay. Um, that, the thing is, uh, it'll only resonate uh -huh. if you don't feel there's an external force that's telling you to do that good behavior. Or it'll resonate more so if yeah. there isn't much of an external force. So yeah. because of that dissonance, that result, yeah. you're like, oh, I'm, I, I have to internalize it. So there's yeah. more. Yeah, this is, I suppose, our whole, the point that we call coercion versus persuasion. That if you can own something, even if you don't fully own it, if you act on it, it will have some impact. Whereas if you're doing it because somebody is ordering you to, you'll just be looking for a way to get out of it as fast as possible. Yeah, that's true. Um, so this role playing, I, I have to confess that uh, I was very snobbish about role playing. I thought that you know, I'm a meditator, I don't have to do this. And I went to a training camp one time for in the early days of nonviolent uh, intervention. And they were doing these role plays, and I said, you know, I, d I didn't think it was very valuable, but on the other hand, I'm, I'm way too chicken to sit out and say I'm not going to do this. So there I am being dragged in, just as Arby said I should not have been, against my will, just because of social peer, peer group pressures. Uh, and I, I entered into this role play, and the, the, the thing that we were acting out, what happened to David Hartso in that uh, lunch counter. I was one of the people sitting at the lunch counter there was a young woman sitting next to me, and there was this crowd of people playing the role of uh, rednecks who were attacking her. And the point of the role play was, what was I supposed to do? What, would I, what should I do in this situation? Well, of course, you know, being a, a complete ham, the minute they started attacking this young woman and reminding myself that this isn't real, <laughs> <laughs> I stepped in front of her and said, no, no, take me instead. <laughs> you know, I'm a nonviolence professor. I don't, I'm not saying this is very likely to happen in real life, but be that as it may, I did that. And they said, okay, we will attack you instead. Now, here's the point that I want to make. I mean, I've already made one point that I'm a hero. Okay, we got that, got that all down. But the real point I wanted to make is the fact is those people were very angry and I was very afraid. So the, uh, the, when the emotions are triggered, whether the event 
is real or you're just acting it out, it does trigger the same emotions and it does give you the same things to work with. And now, of course, we have this uh, stunning Zimbardo study, you know, Philip Zimbardo, a psychologist from Stanford who took people and divided them into prison guards and prisoners and they just see how long it would, you know, they would run the experiment for a while, see if it changed their behavior. They had to stop the experiment after one week because the, quote, prison guards were being sadistic. The sadism was real even though the role was artificial. So, yeah, Matthias. It's interesting to know, to notice that in, in a way, the other side, military, the violent side, yeah. incorporates that they've understood that a long time ago. Yeah. For example, when the soldiers weren't able to shoot other soldiers mm -hmm. from, you know, face to face in the mm -hmm. Korean War or something, the military came up with computer games. Yes. So That's a good point. Emotions and then have them shoot. Good point. You know, and now, and, and our side is, yeah. again, like, behind a little bit. That's it. Why would we need that? What is that yep. We don't need it, you know? Yep. Whereas the other side uses it. They, it, it works. Let's use it. We're, you know, we're, we're spinning all of these airy-fairy ideas here and congratulating ourselves that we don't need to do this. Of course, I'm a particularly bad example of that. I, I was really snobbish in that regard. But it's true. Um, the military has overcome the resistance to kill by getting people to play it out in their fantasies. And a very good friend of mine, um, uh, Nouwen, Henry Nouwen, Belgian theologian, uh, you, you take care of that whole area of the world as far as I'm concerned, Inca, <laughs> Belgian theologian, was sitting on a plane one time talking to someone, this is during the Vietnam War, this fellow was uh, an active combat duty in Vietnam, and, and so Henry Nouwen sort of said, how can you do this? He said, you know, when I went there, I had seen so many cowboy movies that I actually thought that the people I killed would get up and play again in another scene. That's how the fantasy had imposed itself on the reality. So why not use it uh, for positive means? And originally, it was just strategic. We would, th they do a thing called hassle lines where you're being a demonstrator and you're standing there maybe locking elbows and other people who are pretend policemen come up and try to harass you, get you off your, your stable emotional base and by practicing with the emotion then you're able to do it better when you go out on the lines. But if you saw the uh, PBS documentary A Force More Powerful, the first or second segment is about the civil rights movement and you will actually see black and white film footage of James Farmer who is still alive and well thank God doing role plays in the basements of churches in the south before they went out onto these demonstrations. So this has a, a relatively long pedigree in this field and it also has been incorporated into institutions. It's not just something like you go to the local church and say, can we use your basement? But there is a well-known institution, the Highlanders Folk School, which trained people. It's interesting that it's a folk school. Folk Schule, <laughs> not quite. It trained people to do this and to understand why they were doing it, study oppression and things like that. And, you know, people think that Rosa Parks was just some random woman who happened to be sitting on a bus and just one day she just said, I've had it, I'm not going to move anymore. But in fact, she was a graduate of Highlander Folk School. So this, this does matter. You can train people and inject them into the world of social change activism in a more effective place than where they started. Okay. Now I'll put one other thing up here in this category, but if you can think of others, please let me know. There is a whole institution, I'm going to call it an industry, around conflict resolution or conflict mediation or conflict management. Sometimes people don't like the idea of going out and resolving any conflict that comes along because some conflicts are necessary. You need it to build out to your nonviolent moment. 
So if you get people to stop struggling and call that conflict resolution, it's very, very suspicious. I even have a, a colleague at this university who will not touch conflict resolution with a pole for that reason. But whatever we call it, conflict management or whatever, there's a very well-developed science now which operates in phase one of the, resol of the escalation curve. You know, as long as people can still talk to one another, we've got mechanisms for helping them to talk more effectively. Amy? I was just going to say that there's also the idea of com conflict transformation, where you yeah. can use it as an opportunity for growth. Yes, yeah. But what, whatever you, however you're particularly approaching it, there are skills that people have learned. And I guess one of the earliest and most influential works in this country was a book called Getting to Yes by Roger Fisher and William Urey at the Harvard Negotiation Project. So I don't spend a whole lot of time talking about that simply because other people do. And you know, they, we've got phase one pretty well covered. That's the easy part to work on. We've got to launch out into deeper areas. Okay, then there's the strategic level. And I'm, I'm talking mainly about social change activism here. Learning that there's a better, there's a good, a smart way and a dumb way to do stuff is new in this, in this game. There's been, militarists have known that you have to, in fact, the word strategy comes from the Greek word strategos, which means a uh, battle commander. Stratos means army and hegeomai means to lead. So they knew centuries ago, once again, and we are finally catching on, that yes, the point is not to understand things, but to change them. Yes, we all recognize that Karl Marx was correct about that. <laughs> but he was way too angry to be correct about other, a lot of stuff, but he was correct about some stuff. But um, there's also such a thing as expressing your actions in an intelligent way that you've thought about beforehand. And in this connection, there's actually a person who is uh, widely regarded as the dean of nonviolent strategy in the world today. His name is George Lakey. He comes from, he's based in Philadelphia, so as you might have suspected, he has shadowy Quaker origins, <laughs> but he has an organization called Training for Change. And he is actually, he gets contracts, you know, like when Nonviolent Peace Force got started, they recognized they needed to do a lot of training, maybe not as much as I thought they needed to do, <laughs> but they needed to do a lot. And so, you know, you, you Google nonviolent trainers and you come up with George Lakey, Training for Change, and they hired him brought him out to Indonesia to have a training camp for two or three weeks with people before they were sent to Sri Lanka. So I'm very happy about this, about the fact that these things are getting systematized and organized and uh, institutionalized. John, did you? I was going to say, I said that you were speaking about the academic way to do Yeah. John is, I mean, George is a, is a really good guy. There, there were people who worked with him, who used to call him Flaky Lakey, but <laughs> I think it was just for the sake of the rhyme. I don't think there was really anything serious to it. Um, so, you know, he will take role play and a whole bunch of other stuff, and, and in a few weeks or however much you can afford, time-wise and money-wise, he'll train you how to do this. And he's far from being the only person. He's just sort of the most recognizable name right now. I'm happy to say, incidentally, that I got an email from a schoolgirl in some middle school somewhere back east who said her teacher asked her to write an essay on Gandhi, so she, she Googled Gandhi expert and <laughs> came up with me. <laughs> to which we are going to talk about the new technologies if we get around to it. Okay, so then after the strategic level, there's the technical level. And, you know, I'm not saying that these things don't overlap, but it's handy to look at it from these perspectives. And here, there a lot has really been happening in the last 
couple of decades. You remember my saying that when you're training people for nonviolent intervention, TPNI, one, of the th one level of stuff that they have to learn is how to behave appropriately in the target culture that they're going to. It's so easy to make stupid mistakes and get misunderstood. And I remember my son-in-law who was invited to teach medicine in Japan. They, they had to coach him on how you say yes and how you say no in Japanese. <laughs> Because, for example, no is <laughs> it's like that. And so people will never, they will never say yeah, which is the Japanese word for no. They will, because that's way too impolite. But they will move, they will let you know that the answer is no, but they won't say it. But if you're a European or, God forbid, an American where everything is on the surface, straight up, let's sock it to them. And so he didn't say no. So you go out and sign this billion dollar contract only to find out that it was based on thin air. So that's just one sort of amusing example, but it's also possible to do things which you don't realize are threatening. And so it's, it's, it's also necessary to learn the language and the culture in the given area. So that's one part of the technical training that has to go on for nonviolent intervention and has to go on also for other aspects of um, uh, nonviolent training. One important aspect, and I'm, I'm running out of space, but maybe you can jot these down for yourself, is meeting, meeting and facilitation skills. Um, I can't tell you how many times it's happening less often now, which is a good thing, but how many times I have gone to a meeting where people sit around looking at one another, not knowing what to do. And what happens in that case, of course, is that the biggest egos come to the surface first because you know they're the ones who are motivated to get something going here. So um, we're crossing a very difficult bridge from – I'm making this as a very general statement now. We're trying to transition – know. okay, that's not really a verb. We are trying to cross from an area where we have had almost no organization to an area where we can have appropriate organization in which – in a world in which most of the models of organization are not appropriate. You know, the most effective way to organize something quickly is top-down, uh, unilateral. And we discussed last semester how Gandhi got around this where he was able to capture the efficiency without sacrificing the democracy, mainly by saying, okay, provisionally I'm the dictator. You do, he said, I'm your general, do everything that I say, but the minute you don't want me here, I will leave, which is not how generals and dictators traditionally behave. So we're really start groping with these new forms of organization fully aware that there are very powerful forms of organization that would not work for us and how to, how to make that kind of blend. So there are – you can buy big, thick manuals now on how to run a meeting. And these things are – they save you an enormous amount of time if you're going to have to organize stuff. Uh, the Quakers, once again, have been leading the charge here way back in the colonial period. I mean, when the United States was still a colony. Uh, or a set of colonies, and Germany was not a nation yet. <laughs> and they were speaking about 136 different dialects in Holland, and way, way back then, im grauen Vorderzeit, as they say in the dark past. The Quakers were having meetings in New England, what is now New England, where they worked out this consensus process, which is really much more effective and much more articulate than you might think. I mean, I remember going into meetings and saying, we won't do anything until we have a consensus. End result being, we did nothing. <laughs> because, you know, the old saying, six Jews, seven opinions, is almost as true of non-Jewish people as it is of Jewish people. You get its intelligent people together, they are definitely not going to see everything the same way. If they do, they are probably 
President Johnson's cabinet or something like that. They are not really using their intelligence. So, <laughs> so that you have to check that at the door. So it turns out that the, the consensus system was really much more articulate in a couple of very simple ways that made it much more effective. And what they did was they identified, for, they tried as far as possible not to go forward with any decision until they had consensus, and that kept the community together. Look at how divisive it is to have elections, especially the present era when candidates are so similar that there tend to be like 51 to 49. You've got the country split down the middle into winners and losers. And the process itself divides the country. So they didn't want to go forward with anything until they had consensus. So wherever possible, they would talk and talk and talk until they reached consensus. Now, in the 18th century, the early 19th century still, you could afford to do that because the America was about you know, 400 miles wide and to get a message from one part of it to another part took a couple of weeks by, by walking or stagecoach or something, but that is not the way life is anymore. I remember the first time I sent an email to a, a student of mine who was working for the World Bank. That's a whole interesting story in itself. <laughs> Very good things there. But I sent him this email and I didn't get an answer for a couple of hours. And then, then I got an answer saying, oh, I'm sorry it took me so long to answer. I was in Azerbaijan when you, when you wrote. So the world is so different now. It's so speeded up. In fact, even, even without caffeine, here I am rattling along at 100 miles an hour. I hope it's not caffeine. <laughs> um, we've noticed that Sri Ishran and other contemporary meditation teachers place a lot of emphasis on slowing down. And if you look at the previous eras, you don't find that emphasis. The, tech, the, you know, the goal of meditation has not changed. But suddenly there's this emphasis on slowing down. So why do you think that is? My guess is it's because the world has speeded up. And it's still speeding up so fast that you have to be sick. A mind that is slow is well. A mind that is still is God. That was his very nice for Matthias? It might also be, I mean, uh, your research shows that one of the main causes of cancer is stress. Yeah. So that might have a Yeah, and multitasking and s rapidity of thought tend to go together. And I think people have discovered that multitasking is inherently stressful because the mind cannot focus on two things at once. So what you're really doing is you're hopping back and forth. And every time you hop, there's a little expression of stress hormone. So they, they say, this is maybe should be contained in the morning course, but they say that, uh, in act, but Gandhi did say that undue haste is violence. So he had an inkling of this. Undue haste is violence. The speed or multitasking actually leads to the degeneration of brain cells. Harvey? Um, can I know you're talking about the consensus decision, decision making? Yeah. Okay. Isn't it one of the problems, though, that it might be too slow? Well, this is what I was actually getting at. Thank you for pulling me back to the track I was supposed to be on. <laughs> I just have you help me out in my next meditation. <laughs> um, yeah, so what I was saying was that was a practical solution then because things were slower. But it often does not work now. So you need to be able to come to some kind of effective decision while alienating the fewest number of people. So what they actually did was they identified three positions. I go along with this consensus. I, I like it. This is all right with me. Or I stand aside in Quaker language, which is to say, I don't particularly like this, but I'm not going to stop you. Or you say, I block this consensus. It, um, it's, it, my conscience will not let me go there. And you hope that this will not happen very often. You hope that if it does, you will have enough time to work out some kind of an understanding with that person. But the commitment is not to go forward as a group as long as there is anybody blocking the consensus. 
is a single person has veto power, if you want to put it that way. But it's not just like a vote that they cast. You know, they press a button and the light is red instead of green. It's like, I, I can't go along with this yet. We need to talk further or abandon it or something. So that really, it, though it's, you know, it's 150 years ago, it was a more articulate system than we think. And this is one of the, it's an example of one of the things that you'll learn in these manuals on facilitation and meetings. Um, then there are even more technical things like the, one of the earliest was how to go limp when you're arrested. What that means. I remember getting pep talks about this during the free speech movement. I know it's kind of here he goes again. <laughs> but let's face it, it's, it's my moment of glory. I can't just completely forget about it. Uh, but you know, we would actually be uh, instructed how, how to go limp. You know, if, if they pick you up by the wrist, you don't jerk your hand away. You don't do nothing. You just let them do all, sorry, that was New Yorkism. <laughs> you, <don't> do, <laughs> you just let them, let them do with you what they will. You're not going to cooperate, but you're not going to resist. Those are those techniques. And now, when nonviolence has become so much more imaginative, they will teach you things like how to scale a building, how to hang a banner from the 110th story of an office building in Chicago, how to go up on the Golden Gate Bridge and s spread out something that said no more blood for oil, or things like that. All kinds of techniques, which let's face it, you have to have these techniques if you're going to go in certain protest actions. You can't just get, I mean, there, you can't just like even uh, Sproul Hall. I'm not suggesting anything, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but you can't just, you know, stand there and say we're going to scale the building. You have to know how to do it, wh which I do not. But <laughs> so I, I think that we've, so I think we've covered the whole range. I just want to mention from, from meditation to how to scale the Campanile, <laughs> all these things are being taught now. And how to meditate when you get up to the top of the Campanile. <laughs> I, I only want to mention one other thing that probably fits into this category, and that is uh, how to use peace law. One of the things that I wanted to say, and it really took a certain amount of discipline on my part not to say it to Paul Chappell when he was here, because he kept saying how we're so much more dem democratic than we were 100 years ago. And I wanted to point out that we are a lot less democratic than we were 25 years ago. And 25 years ago, there was a recognized body. I'm speaking about the USA. There was a recognized body of peace law. And activists learned some of it and used it. So it's not the case that you know you can go in and hire an expensive lawyer, but there are certain things you need to know. For example, it is the law that if you feel and you have reason to feel that your security is threatened by something which is nonetheless protected by civil law, you have the right to to undertake civil disobedience against that thing. So there were people who actually appealed to this uh, piece of legislation, this concept in legislation, when they went in and banged on very expensive pieces of military equipment with hammers, like the nose cones of rockets and things like this, and with a, with a uh, Ordinary 16-ounce claw hammer that you can buy probably for eight or nine dollars. Uh, haven't bought one for a while, but that's when I used to buy them. They were like three or four dollars. And these real slick fiberglass handles and all the rest of it. Uh, you can destroy a ten million dollar piece of equipment by just banging on the nose cone because they can't fly with any kind of imperfection. So people were arrested. They were charged with malicious destruction of equipment. And uh, the penalties were very, very serious. But they argued, notice I'm using the past tense here. They argued that my security was more threatened by the existence of that object than it was protected. And so I had the right to do that. And there were, there were cases that were dismissed, much to the frustration and disgust of the military. 
However, uh, and you, there were similar kinds of legislation that protected Dan Ellsberg when he released the Pentagon Papers. It, it was a little bit like what we were saying about the Israeli separation wall. Since what the government was doing was itself illegal, our obstruction of it becomes legal. And uh, you know what happened to him. His, he was uh, completely uh, exonerated. His case was dismissed. Again, I'm using the past tense, and you know why I am, because I seriously doubt that anyone would get away with that today, with either of those things. So peace law has fallen into disuse, and law does not work when it is not used. But nonetheless, this has been, and may be again, depending on how well we do our job, this may again become uh, a viable mechanism for peace activists, nonviolent activists, to know about. Okay, so I've mentioned that uh, you can learn stuff from manuals. You can go and take courses from the Ruckus Society. They tend to emphasize the technical part, you know, how to climb bridges without killing yourself and stuff like that. There are organizations that do help you do media work and fundraising and so forth. Okay. Okay, so now we're in this funny position where I finished one topic and I was going to go on to another one. There's only five minutes left. I was going to seg from training to organization. I don't think we're in a terrific hurry. Does any of you have any comments on this or other stuff before we go ahead? Kind of suspected that this might be Perhaps this is kind of the nuts and bolts part of stuff, so this is maybe a little less inspiring than the principles of nonviolence, and it's a little less challenging than the gray areas of nonviolent ethics, but it definitely is something we need to know about. It's one of the things that's changing the picture for nonviolence in the world. Yeah? <laughs> that's a really good question. Uh, and I guess the really not so good answer is I don't know. Um, Kathy Kelly would be the one to ask. She's the most arrested person that I know of. She's slightly more arrested even than Medea Benjamin. Um, uh, I don't think it worked out very well for them when they were in Iraq, for example, trying to deliver humanitarian aid. Uh, I, I can give you one example, which is kind of a negative one. Their outfit was called Voices in the Wilderness, and they delivered, well, maybe even millions of dollars of humanitarian aid, medical and food, to Iraq against the law, breaking the blockade. And uh, the, whoever it is, State Department or whoever sued them, came after them. And they won their case, and Voices in the Wilderness had to pay more money than they could possibly have owned in 100 years. So what they did was disband the organization and reinvent it as Voices for Creative Nonviolence. It was kind of a subterfuge, but they were able to keep on going, and they're very, very effective, still going today. But law did not protect them. Only kind of a subterfugacious mechanism to evade the law was all that protected them. Now, I, I don't like to be bitter or negative about this, but I think that one of the worst things that's happened to the country since the year 2000 election is that the judiciary has been swept in along with the legislative under the umbrella of the executive. And so it's not working nearly as well. It ought I remember there was one episode when people in a town called Jacksonville, Oregon, much smaller than Jacksonville, Mississippi, were just, all they were doing was protesting. Uh, when President Bush was up for re-election, he came through their town. I think I told you about this. Anyway, there was a group of people standing on one side of the road saying, four more years, four more years. And this other group was standing on the other side of the road saying, four more weeks, four more weeks. It was one month to the election. And so the presidential cavalcade, or whatever it is, comes along. There's a president's vehicle with tinted, th inch-thick, bulletproof glass 
windows, followed by unmarked vans with practically no windows at all. And evidently he got on the corner and said, get them people out of here. I should not say that, but I'm sorry. He said, get those people out of here. <laughs> and uh, the van stopped, the doors opened up, fully armed riot police came pouring out of the vans, corralling these people, yelling commands at them or yelling orders at them through bullhorns, which they could not even understand falls on these people, start beating them, knocking a 75-year-old man to the ground, so on and so forth. And nobody even tried to bring a case because that's where things have come to. And I remember saying this in a talk when Marianne Williamson was there and she said, this is not okay. We have to do something about this. But what exactly to do about it is not entirely clear. But there was a feeling even during the Vietnam, anti-Vietnam War protests that although people were very angry and obstreperous, there was a limit beyond which police brutality would not go and the law would apply. And I'm afraid that you now have what's called the Miami syndrome or Miami something where you, know, you had the WTO protests in Seattle were very effective. I think the next similar thing that was tried in the U.S. was Miami. And there, they were ready for us. So they, they you know, used barbed wire, and they controlled the crowds very, very tightly so that they could not get out of hand. They couldn't do anything. And that's the style that they use now around the world. Melissa? Um, I just wanted to say that speaking the technical level right yeah. now, there are a few people that have to are living in a dream near the now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, that was a terrible pun that this is a high point of uh, <laughs> political activism to climb a 60-foot redwood tree, or oak tree in this case. But yeah, I mean, that's another thing that's been learned. And you saw, we saw that very dramatic film clip in the history of Earth First, where people learned from experience and worked it out through partly consensus, partly voting, that they would not do tree spiking and things like that. So learning from Julia Butterfly Hill how to live in a very tall redwood tree for two, uh, two years is another technical skill. Well, technically, I have, uh, I'm out of time. And I, at some point, we'll, we'll talk about new forms of organization. Please do keep up with the reading, even though I don't have a chance to talk about it very much.